operating systems. I wanted to make a video just saying the pros and cons of all of these and actually show you the desktop of them and say, hey, this is what I use each one for. Now, we'll start with Windows because it's the most used one, but we're going to touch on Mac and also Linux today. Uh, as I want to talk about why people use each one of them, because they're each special and the best at what they do, and that's why people choose them. So let's not waste any time, get on the desktop and go over it. Now here on the desktop, there's a couple things Windows has going for it. I would say the first one is this is always pretty much the same. Even with Windows 11, people are pretty familiar with the start menu and how to get around your desktop, even old school stuff. Like I could even go into here, type in control panel and get the old Windows 7 control panel. Everything's very familiar with old Windows, not much changes. And that's why people use it because they know it. And in business, if you don't know something, you're gonna lose a lot of productivity, which means you'll lose a lot of money, and that's just no good for anybody. And that's one big reason people use Windows right now. The other big thing is if we go in here and look, well, I got a bunch of games on here, and we'll pull up old Blizzard Game Launcher to show you that. Here's old Blizzard. You got a whole bunch of different things. A good example is like Call of Duty. Uh, a lot of people use like Warzone and anti-cheat games, and these things change all the time, and they pretty much require Windows. Now, that may change in the future, but every game is meant for Windows in mind. They design it for Windows. That means it's going to work the best on Windows. Even with some of the downsides and cons of Windows, it's just important to realize if you're a hardcore gamer and you're playing a ton of different types of games... Windows is typically what you're going to be using. And one of the big drawbacks of Windows, and I'll just pull up Task Manager here, I will say it is very heavy. Bloated by design. Like right here, this seems like a pretty minimal existence, but it has 180 processes going. Uh, coupled with any other operating system I'm going to talk about, this is probably going to be double. So it's going to use a lot more of the resources of this computer. It's going to require a beefier computer to have the same performance of any counterpart I talk about today. Now, now you can't address this with the bloat scripts that I've done in the past, but by general, it's just a kind of a drawback or a con. The other big thing is the actual settings and Windows updates. If we go into Windows Update, yeah, this is always just a big headache and a problem because these updates usually come at the worst times. A lot of times it will even go ahead and ignore your settings and start installing during a productivity time. I can't tell you how many game streamers has had a stream interrupted because it just started updating Windows right in the middle of a game or something like that. And uh, same goes for business. I've had people in the middle of like drafting a contract and then all of a sudden Windows decided it needed to do updates right then. And that's terrible. Uh, the update system is something Microsoft has done a terrible job with. And I think they'll, they'll get better with this. I think in Windows 11, I think they're working on this because you can pause updates. And I think they're gonna make things a little easier for folks to control. And uh, I personally have always used group policy to manage this in business but most people don't know how to do that or haven't used my debloat tool. I'll link, put a link up here for that. And it causes them to have a really bad experience with Windows. And probably the last and final thing with Windows is it's kind of insecure by design. This is not a great experience. A, a lot of times you can get right into a root folder and start deleting things. And that's a, that's a problem. Uh, I know a lot of times they try to kind of band-aid this in the past 10 years, and they've done a lot better job than the Windows XP era, and even Windows 7, uh, where it had a whole bunch of file system vulnerabilities, but it's still not perfect. You still have print nightmare and a lot of other issues that have happened this year, coupled with a lot of ransomware attacks that have led to all kinds of problems, and that is more of a Windows problem than a, another operating system because Mac and Linux typically are security first by design where it's kind of tacked in in Windows where they added like UAC for elevating that prompt. But a lot of times Windows by nature, it's very easy to run something as administrator where it's much more difficult in a Mac or a Linux environment because it's just structured different. Next up, we have Linux. Uh, this is something that looks drastically different from every other operating system. 
because it's probably the most versatile and customizable one out of here. So let's go ahead and log in here. And I'm using KDE, but there's a whole bunch of different desktops. It could look like this or this or this or this, uh, the, the sky is the limit when it comes to what Linux could be. It is truly an enthusiast OS, something where you design what you want, but it's very intimidating because it's far more broad and there's so much more to do. Depending on if I'm, let's say I'm troubleshooting something in Linux, it, it's a nightmare from a tech support perspective because I don't know what uh, desktop environment they're on or what package manager or distribution that person, all these things can be different and interchangeable, which makes support very, very difficult. And that's why you really don't see any adoption in the real world past your enthusiasts or your, your folks that really want to get in and change everything with their system. But it is fantastic. And I will say it is well designed. Like even KDE here, we can change the global theme with just a click of a button. You can go dark, light, you can change all your hotkeys to go ahead, pull up File Explorer, browsers, have different workspaces. It's innovated so much stuff. The thing about Linux is so good that a lot of these other operating systems have actually gone ahead and just changed the game and said, okay, well, Linux has that. I'm just gonna take that source code because guess what? Everything's free and open source. and that means anybody can use and abuse Linux, which it does get used and abused by big tech quite often because a lot of times it's first on Linux and then they go, ooh, I like that. We need to add that to our operating system. Much like workspaces I just showcased, on Windows, they added virtual desktops. On Mac, I think they added virtual desktops after Linux as well. So it's really neat. But the cool thing is uh, a lot of times, I think I still have it on here. Caden Live was actually what I designed my first 500 videos in Linux on. So the first 500 videos I made on my main channel was from Caden Live which is completely free and open source, which is kind of nuts. I think there's a couple ones at the beginning when I was on Windows, I was using like Femora or something, but it was such a better experience as soon as I moved to Caden Live compared to a lot of even the paid counterparts. Now, mind you, this last operating system, Mac, I'm gonna talk about, and you're gonna see what I've done today, but I wanted to say this is what I really used to use, and it's a fantastic editor, video editing, for someone just getting into video editing or just need basic functionality, Caden Live checks all the boxes. And I would say it even goes a little bit further and says it's easier to use than many of these other full featured uh, video editors that have a whole host of tools and it's a little bit daunting where Caden Live is much more noob friendly. And it's not only that, I still use a lot of things today, such as GIMP. This is what I've actually used for all my thumbnails. Every single YouTube channel I have, any thumbnail I'm making, I'm using GIMP. Even if I'm on Windows, even if I'm on Mac, I only use it. A lot of people are always talking about Adobe, but Adobe I'm not a big fan of. And honestly, once I learned GIMP, I don't think I'll ever use Photoshop again, just because GIMP satisfies all the needs I need. Now, I'm not a professional editor by any means. I just use it for thumbnails and for me this is more than adequate and probably the last thing as far as a pro in linux i can talk about is the productivity i kind of touched on going between workspaces launching things i can ssh in and change servers around the sky's the limit and i can always hotkey everything so as i'm talking i can move between desktops i can launch whatever i need in a click of a button it's very fast and if you're a highly productively focused person that has all the tools they need in Linux, by all means, stick with it. But it's not without its cons. So let's talk about that real fast when it comes to Linux. I talked the, about that in the very first part, it's inconsistent because it can look like KDE or it could look like completely different from this. It could look like GNOME. It could look like a tiling window manager, which I've covered in the past. And you just don't know how this is. The other thing is it can be a little rough around the edges because a lot of things just don't work like it would normally on like a Mac or Windows because they're only working with one display or one display environment, I should say. And this uh, has to deal with a whole bunch of different things. So you run into display scaling. Sometimes when you have multiple monitors or 4K monitor support, it's real dicey whether or not that actually happens. 
Also, newer hardware, you run into that inconsistency because that those drivers from the new hardware hasn't made it into the mainline kernel or maybe you use an older distribution. There's just so much inconsistency with Linux that uh, that's why I don't think it'll ever be mainstream. But that's just kind of the big things about Linux. It's inconsistent and it has compatibility problems, but at the same time, these are kind of boons as well because you can do anything you want with it. And if you have older hardware, this thing, you can make a, I can make a Linux box run and feel like a brand new machine on 10, 15 year old hardware to where people will be like, oh, this is fantastic. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm using your 10 year old computer. And they're like, what? That thing was so laggy on Windows, I couldn't even do anything. So it, it just depends. There's a time and place for Linux. And I really, really enjoy it for these things. Oh, Mac. It's the last one on the list. And this is one of, it, it, out of the three, it's probably the least one I, I like being in. Mainly because uh, I'll get into the cons after I explain the really the big pros here. But it's probably my least favorite out of all three. But I still use it on a daily basis because for creators, it is simply amazing. When it comes to Final Cut Pro, the editing, using the M1 chip with ARM architecture, what I'm able to do in here blows my mind. And it's so easy to do all the things I want to do with video editing. Uh, now, I do color grading. I do a lot of different scenes. I actually edit in full 4K or actually 38 by 20 and a 1080p, and then I chop it up. I'll, I'll link to a video up here going over my entire video editing routine process, but Final Cut Pro is by far the best on the market. I don't know how anybody uses Premiere or anything else compared to Final Cut Pro. It's so easy. And everything else in here, it's secure. It's a very reliable experience. I, I hadn't used Mac in like 10 years and I jumped right back in, fell right at home. I was like, oh, everything is still there. All the shortcuts right here. You just learn them and say, okay, if I want to go to the home folder, I just go shift command H and it'll launch into my home folder. Uh, these are all great things. And the settings menu is also very minimal and it works. It's a consistent and a reliable experience Every time I boot this machine up, I know exactly what to expect. It, it performs the exact same way every time. There's something to be said for that. Like I said, remember when I said earlier about, hey, can suck that productivity aspect of it? If you can do everything from a business perspective in here, uh, the big strengths of it is it's consistent. And you can use a lot of cool different tools, like obviously Final Cut Pro I showed. If you're an Adobe person, I would say Mac is almost mandatory for Adobe these days. And also on top of that, the Office Suite, Microsoft Office, runs better on Mac than it does on Windows. <laughs> I think that says more about Windows than it does about Mac. But the fact that Office does run very, very well on Mac is kind of funny. So what are the downsides to Mac? Well. To me, the reason why I'm not in it very much, other than to edit videos, it is boring. This really doesn't change. It's a strength, but it's also kind of a, a negative. Uh, yes, I, I've customized it a bit to where I have like some add-ins and I can do uh, this. I can go ahead and change and launch like Mission Control and change my desktops. If I needed to add a bunch of virtual desktops, I can go ahead and toss a couple of those guys in, switch it around. Uh, but, you know, it just depends on what you want. And for me, I'm like, okay, uh, this this is okay, but I'd rather be in Linux doing that. And I just am bored with Mac, which is a good thing and a bad thing. And probably the other big aspect of Mac that I really don't enjoy is its ecosystem. It is insanely priced. You know how in Wind uh, Linux, everything was free and open and uh, Windows has kind of like an in-between the two. Mac, it's really the system meant for millionaires <laughs> because you can just sink tons and tons of money to get that snapping from Magnet. Well, I went ahead and bought this because it was $3. But I mean, every little tiny tool you can pay money for, a lot of times you do. It does have some open source and free software. A lot of developers actually use Mac and use like Homebrew and other things to get around this. But most folks will stick with just the Apple Store and pay a premium because of this walled garden ecosystem. I'm not necessarily 
upset about that. I'm just saying, hey, it's kind of a con. If you are budget minded, probably want to stay far away from a Mac because of this, or try to stay with Homebrew and try and get all these uh, custom free and open software on Homebrew over and, and stay away from the App Store. But a lot of things just aren't there, or there's a better counterpart in the App Store that you, you kind of want and is better than what is the free and open software equivalent. Now, having said that, I want to just reemphasize, no operating system is better than another. It just depends on your needs. And it's really important to just use the right tool for the job. Too many times have I pigeonholed myself in an operating system because that's just what I wanted. But the realities of it, each one of these operating systems is good for their own independent thing. And these are just the pros and cons of them. And I know there's a lot that I missed in this video, but I kind of want to just kind of give a brief overview of all three as each one is good for their own thing. And I use each one for what they're needed. How about you? Let me know in the comment section and I'll see you in the next one.